Okay, this is the Q&A part. I'm going to uh, uh, exercise the uh, authority of the moderator, if that's okay, uh, to ask uh, Jay a question, and that is, um, we're all looking for indicators of what the bottom is, right? Um, um, one indicator I've heard of, you've probably all heard of it, is cardboard shipments. You know, when cardboard shipments uh, go up, that's an indicator, Charlie, right, uh, that things are turning around. Uh, could you share with us, there must be a uh, trade secret in your business, Jay, of a, uh, of a leading indicator, some metric where uh, publicly held companies are doing something that would indicate uh, a level of confidence restoring to the system. Well, one of the things, um, do you want me to come up there? Uh, uh, I, I think you have a... One of the things we're yeah. um, focused on, of course, is the M&A activity. Um, that's a good indicator of where companies uh, uh, are going, and we, we see some, some cycl cyclicality to how companies react in this particular time. You probably have noticed that there's, quite, there's, there's almost virtually no IPO traffic right now. Um, we as a company, I think, won the first IPO that was launched in, in an 18-week period uh, recently. So, I mean, there's a, a huge ban, and that typically was a great pipeline for us to say for every company that might have been acquired or went bankrupt, there would be another company in its place that we would bring on board to say that they were just launching and they had a new idea. So we had this kind of a flow of, of transactions that would constantly replenish our book of business. Well, the IPO market's been dropped off, so that's something we're watching very closely. And then, of course, you've got a lot of people sitting on the sidelines. There, there are some fine corporations out there that are sitting on just a load of cash, and I'm sure all of you read about that in the Wall Street Journal. Well, when some of them start to get aggressive, uh, we'll look to that as an indicator as well. And we also have a lot of internal metrics in terms of trading on individual companies that we tend to look at. We have not seen anything uh, very hopeful uh, that would say that we're at the end of this, but we, we definitely have our indicators of how we're going to look for the market to turn so you'll, around. You'll report it back to here oh, first. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> okay, um, we open it up to questions now. Yes, George. Yeah, I have one uh, for Eric. I'm wondering, in your opinion, was the original intent of PARP the right intent, right? Because lending's not happening because the balance sheets that those banks have, right, and the capital ratio that they have to maintain. If you would have taken out those toxic assets, that tension wouldn't exist today, perhaps, right? So it was the original intent to buy up those toxic assets as opposed to, you know, just dumping money into the banks. Was that probably a better approach, in your opinion? Well, I think there's a lot, th there are a lot of issues there. And, and one is, no matter how analytical you are, we all need to react to crises. And the immediate crisis that happened right after that was the issue of would there be you know, cre stabilizing the 20 largest, 40 largest, whatever they were banking institutions in the United States. So that was an immediate crisis that was addressed. Was, would the TARP high in the tax assets have helped? <coughs> Clearly would have helped if it worked. As I mentioned in my talk, one of the, it seems to me that one of the key elements was nobody knew what the pricing should be of those assets. And that created a type of paralysis that I think led us down another road. <coughs> it's interesting, there are, there are a lot of friends, I'm sort of, one of the things that has amused me over the past um, three or four months. And uh, for those of you from the Fed, you'll understand this. We have gotten a lot of questions from companies that don't have these kinds of issues, asking us whether they should be registering as bank holding companies. <laughs> and uh, as if it is all you know, a free pipeline to a great flow of money. And there's a, it's another way of saying there's a lot of misunderstanding within, within the public and the community as to what all this means, what the implications of some of these regulations and statutes are, and how these issues should be best addressed. Yeah. Can I just Any add, um, the, the one issue that I think um, taught, sort of took him away from the idea of acquiring assets as opposed to <coughs> investing was this leverage issue, that is, that when you're dealing with the just the asset side of the bank, it, you can take those off, but it doesn't have the same multiplier effect as if as when you're dealing with the capital piece on the balance sheet. And 
when you deal with a capital piece, then you have the, you know, the, the multiplier of, you know, capital asset ratios. So I think that's, I don't know whether they should have stuck with that strategy or not, but I think the conventional <coughs> wisdom was that the dollars wouldn't go as far if you were only dealing with that type of strategy. Did we have a question over here? Yes. Yeah, just a follow up on the, the pricing of toxic assets. And is it so much a question of trying to figure out what the price is, or is just certain tranches of those mortgage-backed securities are worthless because the underlying loans are bad? Mm -hmm. how, how much of it is you, you're trying to pick a number versus the, 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 there's, there's no value in this epidemic? Well, I guess I'd say it's both. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Eric, do you want to take a crack at that? Yeah, I mean, the experience here in the Massachusetts area during the crisis of 80, 1989 to 1991 showed that after a period of time, assets that were very, very depressed at the nadir of the market had risen in value and had regained value very substantially. So things that are, quote, regarded as worthless today, and, and I'm not saying that none of them are, might well turn out to have some significant value two, two, three, four years from now. And so part of that, when you price it, if you look at it entirely at a spot picture on one day, you definitely are not getting a long-term fair picture of what that value is. Yes, just, just, just to elaborate on that point a little bit, um, as a, I hate to say this in a crowd like this, but as a former securitization lawyer, uh, <laughs> and one who still is a practicing securitization lawyer, I, I do know a bit about how those uh, structures work internally. And there's this central tension, it seems to me, that's making its way through the banking, the whole bank rescue plan, as well as inside the structures. And they're, they're kind of uh, duplicative of one another, and that is, do you uh, go with immediate price discovery. Everyone's saying we've got to know what these assets are worth uh, to clear the system so we don't have the same issue as Japan where you're sitting on uh, troubled assets for 10 years and you're not coming clean with what they're worth. And then there's the other side of it which is uh, how do you preserve capital for the banks? Because if you're going to take the assets from the banks at mark to market values then it's not going to do the banks much good from a capital adequacy point of view since they're going to have to take large write downs. The same thing, the same tension is operating within the securitized structures because you have different classes of securities holders, some of whom can be perfectly well compensated if they're at the top of the capital stack. If you go ahead and liquidate the underlying assets now, today, at today's prices, because they have so much uh, subordinated ca uh, cla capital holders underneath them. Who will take the who will take the loss, and uh, and then the people at the bottom of the capital stack are saying, no, you got to let this work its way out. We got to have workouts. We got to get the special servicers in gear to um, modify these loans and give them more time to tour. And uh, you probably read the article in the Wall Street Journal last week called "Tranche Warfare" that has to do with the local landmark, the John Hancock Building. That very issue is what's being debated and will ultimately get litigated inside many of these uh, structured vehicles over the next, probably the next many months and maybe more than more than that period of time. Right, right. Uh, and meanwhile, the, uh, the indications from the actual mortgage level itself are oftentimes conflicting. Just in the last uh, two, 48 hours, uh, there have been reports of a significant uptick in the uh, sale of, uh, of uh, previously owned homes, mostly due to foreclosure sales, right? Which is a good thing, normally, in terms of clearing the market. And then you read today's Wall Street Journal, and you hear about the uh, pox on the uh, so-called jumbo uh, mortgage market, which is uh, headed for the, the skies, it appears. And we're just at the beginning edge of that, so it's hard to tell at the grassroots level where all of this is settling out at the moment. In, while the tranches are at war with one another, as Ron points out. All right, question for you, uh, Andrew. On the credit default swap, you mentioned the market could be as potentially as large as 60 billion, 60 trillion dollars. 
Uh, but then AIG mentioned that it had about $500 billion exposure. Uh, are there a lot of other players in this market then? I, I always thought they were the big ones. And, uh, <coughs> well, there are a lot of other players, I think. I think the investment um, banks as well. I mean, part of the problem with the whole discussion about credit default swaps is the you know, s sort of lack of good information that's available in, in knowing. And clearly, I think the, you know, um, you know, there may be others in the room that know more about this than I do, either at the Fed or Ron or other people. But you know, the investment bank, the investment banking industry was was uh, a major, major player. So like any any major investment banker, and they were running into these same kinds of issues, which explains in part why there's this flight to the Fed, because by converting to um, financial holding companies subject to Federal Reserve oversight, they do gain access to, to federal, you know, not only the, the bailout money, but also to the other kinds of credit resources of the Fed. And that comes at a price, obviously, because the Fed is now going to step in and impose the kinds of risk-based capital requirements that investment banking companies didn't have to live with in the past, now are going to have to live with under this new regime. But I think the you know investment banks as a whole um, probably represent, and it's a worldwide market too. I mean, I think this sixty trillion. It's not clear how much of that is is domestic and how much is the, uh, the mono lines also were active participants in the credit default swap market. It was a separate division. They didn't write when they weren't writing bond insurance. They were writing credit default swaps. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> question over here. Yeah, I have a question about um, in the H.R. 384, there's a, an early part that talks about the regulatory, the actual enforcement of having examples coming into the banks and assessing what is being done with money to banks. Is there any kind of idea on um, how much of an examiner lag is going to be as far as training examiners in this matter and getting the quantity of people up? Because it seems to be expansion of regulatory burden, but there has to be staff that do all the actions. Um, are there any thoughts of how long it will take for that to be actually get? In action and in action. There's going to be people being employed. Mm. <laughs> Eric, you want to? Well, I think the first aspect is simply reporting outside of the examination problem. There'll be a flow of information which has already started. Some of it's being published and you know, being reported in the newspapers on some levels. Then there'll be reports, disclosure in the quarterly financial statements of the entities. So those are sort of the cost to the company, perhaps, but not cost to the regulators. In terms of training, I don't, I would imagine that this would simply be incorporated into the regular examination cycles uh, of the, exam of, of the uh, bank regulatory agencies, although there are others in this room who may, may comment more on that. And as usual, they, bank regulatory agencies do a very good <coughs> job of cross-training on, on whatever currency. And with the use of the internet these days, that is being done much more efficiently than it was when I started practicing in the old days. And I think they were also very, getting very good about sharing expertise in ways that were not true 30 years ago. In my case, it was 40 years ago. Another question? I have one uh, question for Andy, and that has to, you, you mentioned the, uh, the use of the exchanges uh, as uh, perhaps a curative way for credit default swaps. And um, uh, reports that I've read refer to the same phenomenon that is going on as we speak, um, but they only refer to it in the, uh, in the sense of clearing and settlement, but not in terms of trading. And I wonder if you could uh, talk to us or if anybody else in the room could shed some light on that notion of how clearing uh, and settlement would uh, help to add transparency to the market, but why these instruments are not um, appropriate for trading on an exchange? Well, I think putting them, you know, the move to to uh, recognized exchanges does a couple of things. One is it, it does um, give people a better sense, there's more transparency in terms of what's out there and who the players are, and, and so from a systemic risk point of view, I think it, it sheds more light on what is going on with credit default swaps. Um, and I, so I, um, there's something else that I just lost. Standardization of the contract? <clears throat> well, standardization, uh, to some extent, standard, they're, yeah. they're, they're reasonably standardized, I would, I would say, 
today. To the extent we know that was part <coughs> of the issues of the Volcker and the other commissions <coughs> was that the documentation wasn't easy to find and, and yeah. summarize and see, and that was the concern. Yeah. Um, so, at least in my view, I thought the standardization of the contracts to commit the clearing is only as a major step yeah. forward, as simplistic as it may sound. And I guess the other thing that I was going to say is that there's a there's a big issue out there in terms of, you know, what if you netted out all of these transactions, um, you know, people, uh, different players in the industry have entered into a variety of different transactions, and to some extent, there's there's this sense that um, there's this there's if you if you looked at it at a at a on an exchange or in a, in a larger context, you would see places where the the, um, the transactions could net out to a much greater extent, and you could, in effect, lower the total volume of, of this of the stuff that's out there just through you know the same parties being involved in the transaction. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So one more question. No, I was just going to comment on that. It's, yeah. Credit swaps actually go back to like the mid '80s or so. But they were all, at the time, customized, and so it was only like you said about 10 years ago or so that we really saw them become standardized and attached to CDOs and other types of contracts. Right. But I think you're right. There's that 60 trillion probably double counts a lot of it, and clearing it would probably give you a better sense of the numbers. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, um, thank you very much. I want to just uh, take this moment to thank Nancy and our friends at Brown Runner for being wonderful hosts for this uh, kickoff again event. I want to thank uh, Jay and Eric and Andy for their excellent presentations. I like to <laughs> Two weeks hence, we will have a similar format, similarly formatted program uh, where. Uh, Jay's place will be taken by uh, David Martell, the executive director of Cushman and Wakefield, prominent real estate uh, brokerage firm in the country, and who will give us a perspective on, uh, on the business of commercial real estate, which is being hit heavily by this. Um, Ken Ehrlich uh, will be sitting here in, in uh, Eric Fisher's place, giving us the update on everything that's happened <coughs> in the last two weeks. Uh, in the middle chair, we're, we will probably be talking about TARP, although um, indications say that there are some things coming related to TARP uh, that will be very significant, perhaps even in the next couple of weeks. So uh, for the moment, we'll, uh, we'll uh, do a drill down on, on the TARP, uh, two weeks hence. That, that's February 11th, I believe. And are we meeting here that day? Same yep. place. Same place, same, same time. time. Um, and then finally, uh, I want to thank you all for coming out in this uh, awful weather. It seems to be clearing up now. Um, there is a very important meeting going on in Washington right now. It is concluding today. Does anybody know what that is? Barry, you can weigh in on that. this one? It's FOMC. Maybe. Oh, okay. <laughs> FOMC. And FOMC stands for? Federal Open, Market Federal Open Market Committee. You all know what the Federal Open Market Committee. If you don't, you look it up. Okay, but there's another FOMC we know, right? And that's the Friends of the Morin Center. <laughs> and because I am a former official of the Fed in Washington, I'm I'm empowered, I'm vested with the authority to appoint new members of the FOMC, which I am besp bes bestowing on all of you. So before you rush to the airport to get down to the FOMC meetings in Washington, uh, just go online and uh, recognize that, that you'll be getting emails from us from time to time about upcoming events like this. And then, for example, on uh, April, 25th, uh, April 15th, I think it is, uh, we have a lecture by uh, Marsh Carter, uh, chairman of the New York Stock Exchange, former uh, CEO of State Street uh, Corporation, most or all of you know him, uh, will be delivering a major lecture at the, the law school at, uh, on the campus at Boston University. So welcome to the FOMC. And thank you all for coming today. I hope we see all of you and some of your friends uh, on February 11th.